The subject for our study now is Revelation chapter 19. We have come down to that period of time in the presentation where we have seen Babylon the Great, the mother, mother of harlots, to fall from her position of loftiness and power over the nations to utter annihilation. And then we have seen also that with that there has come the, the vindication of all the saints of God. And you'll recall the cry that was going out back in chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 for vengeance answered in chapter 18 as God takes vengeance on his enemies. Now then we're entering the finale of the book of Revelation when we turn to chapters 19 to 22. This has been preceded by the seven letters to the seven churches, the book with seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath, and now then the finale. Notice please that each of these items are following sequentially as John unfolds the message of the book of Revelation. Also, I think it would be very important for us always to keep in mind that what John is writing about would be those things which he said must shortly come to pass. He's writing to the seven churches of Asia and he's talking, talking about things that immediately affect them. To establish this before we get into the 19th chapter is kind of basis. It is truly a fundamental point in understanding Revelation if we're going to understand it, reading it through first century glasses. Let's go back to the opening chapter of the book, Revelation chapter 1, and read where John says that. The opening verse, here's what he has in anticipation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now that's the situation all the way through the book. Follow with me if you will. Let's go to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22, in verse 6. Go all the way to the end with me. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So there's the context or setting of the book of Revelation in that connection as far as the time period of its presentation. It is something that must shortly occur. Revelation 1, 1, Revelation 22 at verse 6. Any system that does not honor that is certainly not reading the book through first century glasses and stands open to criticism and leads people from really comprehending John's message. He began it and he ended it by saying this applies to you people in the seven churches of Asia Minor in A.D. 96. Now let's come to Revelation, the 19th chapter. One of the things I like to say to sort of preface this chapter as we begin is this chapter contains the Battle of Armageddon in it. Now we have seen the Battle of Armageddon first mentioned in chapter 16, verse 16. But what remarkable item connected with that do you find there? Do you find the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16, 16? No, there's the only time that you find the word Armageddon in all of the Bible. When we studied chapter 16, we noticed the Valley of Megiddo, but we saw there never was a mountain of Megiddo mentioned anywhere in the Bible except in Revelation 16, 19. What did you find? What interesting feature? You found them gathered together in Revelation 16 at verse 16. Was the battle of Armageddon back there? No. The battle of Armageddon is not fought until you get to Revelation chapter 19. And before we leave the chapter today, we're going to be discussing the battle of Armageddon as it is presented to us right here in Revelation 19 verses 19 and 20. Let's begin with the reading of the text. And as we do, we'd like for you to notice that this is the presentation of the elders that we had seen before the throne. We had discussed it back then. Does this represent the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel? They are revered worthies from Bible times that are called the elders. And we will find them here as they bow before the worship of the throne of God Almighty in anticipation of his final victory over his foes. Again, keep in mind that we have said that the key word in the book is overcome. We've seen it repeatedly. The key thought is victory of Christ over his foes. The key verse is chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. Now then, Revelation 19, 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Now this means hallelujah or praise to God. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. 
for true and righteous are his judgments. And he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And then in verse 4, we find the worship of the elders before the throne. <clears throat> And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and in the voice, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. In this passage, we've seen for the sixth time the worship of the elders before the throne of God. We saw that when we were initially introduced to them back in chapter 4 at verse 8. We saw it again as we move from this text over to Re Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, Revelation chapter 5 verse 14, Revelation chapter 7 verse 11, and then the other two times, Revelation 11, 6, and here in Revelation 19, 4. It's interesting to just notice from the standpoint of the worship of the elders in those verses. If you were to go and just read those verses and to look at the context in which the worship of these elders who are before the throne of God occurs, you'll see what a dramatic presentation that, I that is. Again, those verses, chapter 4, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 10, cha rather five, chapter 5, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 14, chapter 17, at verse 11, chapter 11, verse 16, and here in chapter 19 at verse 6. Notice, too, he says, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Well, we have endeavored to make that point as we proceeded, but here you find it in one word. Remember how we went back to the Old Testament and studied in Daniel, the fifth chapter, or the fourth chapter, rather, verse 35? We saw Nebuchadnezzar's conclusion that God rules in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. We see that here in one word, the word omnipotent. It is from the word omni meaning all and potent meaning power, omni powerful, all powerful. The Lord God is all powerful. That means he is able to overcome the devil, even as you see him doing that right here in the book of Revelation, as we have seen him do that truly down through history. You'll notice that the Roman Empire stands no more. That which was said regarding it by our Lord truly has come to fruition. Now, in Revelation 19, we continue to read in verse 7 where we find the reaction or the response to the elders' announcement saying hallelujah and they're praising God and they're praising Him for His righteous judgments and His judgment upon wickedness. In verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See thou do it not, for I am of thy fellow servants and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy. Well, here you will find the triumph of the church. It was the church that was being persecuted. It was the seven churches of Asia, each making up the churches of Christ, Romans 16, 16. Paul taught the same thing in all the churches, 1 Corinthians 4 at verse 17. There wasn't a denominational church in one location, a denominational church in another location, for denominations were unknown of by anyone on the face of the earth until the 1500s. In the first century, there is one body, Ephesians chapter 4, at verse 4. It is variously referenced as the church of God, the church of the firstborn, the church of the living God, churches of Christ, Romans 16 at verse 16. Here the Lord's bride is the church. She has made herself ready. As a gospel preacher, I often use this passage as a text to encourage members of the church and for us as a congregation to be ready for the return of the Lord. That is what we as the bride of Christ are encouraged to do. Passages of Scripture like Matthew 25 and Mark 13 encourage us to be ready and watchful and waiting for the Lord. We saw in chapter 15, the blessed is the one that watcheth. 
And there the state of preparedness of God's people is under consideration. Notice that it is the responsibility of the church that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We are indeed a righteous people as Christians. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, this marriage supper of the Lamb is actually a feast that is going to be pictured later as the uh, eagles or the vultures of the air come and eat the remnants of what is left when this final battle is over. They're going to feast upon the remnants. In other words, they're going to enjoy the victory over their foes. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now notice too, if you would, as we studied this passage, this book it is about the church overcoming Remember, we have seen how that even Roman emperors wanted to destroy Christianity or to destroy the church, and they were unable to. And what a sigh of relief in history as we read about the Edict of Toleration that was issued under Constantine in 312 A.D. The church was under fierce persecution. The desire was for it to go away entirely. But the church is victorious. We see it never being obliterated, just as Daniel prophesied in Daniel 2, verse 44, and in other texts of Scripture. Now then in verse 11 of Revelation 19, And I saw heaven opened, John said, And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him. Friends, this is going to be the presentation of Jesus Christ as he rides forward from heaven for the purpose of defeating his enemies. Notice the glorious picture. We have long awaited this in our study of the book of Revelation. We've wanted to see Christ be ultimately, finally victorious over his foes. And that's what we're about to see. John said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and the flesh of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both great and small. There you have the introduction of Jesus Christ as the victorious conquering general. He is called the captain of our salvation in Hebrews chapter 2 at verse 10. His vesture dipped in blood we have seen to qualify him as the lion of the tribe of Judah in chapter 5. It is his blood that is shed for the remission of our sins. Matthew 26, 28. He tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. He is the mean by, means by which sins are taken away, not for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. In 1 John chapter 2 at verse 2. The power of that crimson flow from the side of our Lord on Calvary's cross made the way possible for people like you and me to be saved evermore in heaven above. Christ is going to be victorious over every foe. The vesture dipped in blood and a name written, a name that emphasizes again and underscores and highlights the theme of the book of Revelation. That name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How long is he going to reign? A thousand years? No, not just a thousand years. He shall reign forever and forever. Jesus Christ, the mighty Son of God, when he came out dressed as he was in that kind of array, an angel standing in the sun cried with a loud voice, prepare yourself, you're about to see the total destruction of the enemies of Christ. Now, had you been living in Asia Minor at that point in the first century, had you seen your loved ones and friends being persecuted for the cause of Christ, maybe even being put to death, perhaps even by beheading, 
Don't you know the sadness that would have filled your heart and your life? And now then to finally see the picture that as it is unveiled to us by the pen of the Apostle John's inspiration, one known as the Apostle of Love, communicating the love of God and the sensitivity of God toward His people, that He cares for them. He will never leave them nor forsake them. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, He'll be with them always, Matthew 28 at verse 20 tells us. Don't you know the encouragement that you would receive by reading Revelation chapter 19 and seeing Jesus Christ standing forward as he does as a valiant conqueror. The battle of Armageddon is about to be fought next. In verses 19 and 20, we're going to see this battle fought. I want you to read carefully. If you haven't been following along in your Bible and you have it accessible to you, you might want to get it right now because I want you to read along with me and see the battle of Armageddon. Again, bear in mind, it is mentioned in chapter 16, verse 16, the gathering together. This gathering is again made reference to right here in these verses. They're gathering together to the battle. It hadn't been fought yet. Now we're going to see the battle of Armageddon in its entirety fought in chapters 19, verses 19 and 20. Here we go. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. Remember the beast is the one who came up out of the sand of the sea who's operating with the full force of the devil's power and might. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. See, I told you they were gathered. The battle of Armageddon, the gathering together for the battle, 1618. Gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. The stage is set. Christ is there. The armies of heaven are there. I mentioned back earlier in Daniel chapter 4, you remember, the armies of heaven do according to his will. He is the omnipotent reigning king of kings and lord of lords. And before him there is stretched the beast, that red beast with seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns on, his, on those horns. He is there with all of the power and influence of Satan himself, along with the kings of the earth. They're all set. The battle is ready to go. Watch verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, which wrought miracles before him, and which he deceived them, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Did you see the battle of Armageddon? I'll tell you what, when the Son of God rode forth, when he comes out to destroy his enemies, like we sometimes say, it's over before it ever gets started. Like one guy threatened holding his fist up, you come after me, there'll be two licks. I'll hit you and you'll hit the ground. Well, when Jesus Christ appears, this battle is over before it gets started. How does this happen? What's taking place? We read earlier, and let me refresh our memories by dropping us back just now to 2 Thessalonians in the second chapter where reference is being made to this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 at verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Christ destroys his enemy with the spirit of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. We have seen reference being made to the spirit of his mouth with his sharp sword. We saw that as he's described in chapter 1. We see it again here as he has this sword, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 at verse 17. Jesus Christ has destroyed his enemy. There you'll have Revelation 19, which we're calling the army of God is victorious. Well, the battle of Armageddon then, as presented in chapter 16, is fought in chapter 19. And it is a total destruction of the enemy. Next, we'll move into chapter 20, and we will see the uh, doom of the devil. That'll be followed by a description of heaven in chapter 21, and a further and concluding description of heaven in Revelation chapter 22. Now, let's go to the premillennial view of this chapter and see what those who write have to say about this. And let's dispel these who are looking through 21st century glasses. We've had the privilege to read Revelation chapter 19 through 1st century glasses. 
Now we have the opportunity to go ahead and to remove that which is a barrier to our understanding of the book of Revelation, the, book, the theory of premillennialism. And let's see what they have to say. And we want to look at the main tenets that they want to present. Sometimes these are a little involved. They are many times convoluted. But as we dispel them, it's worth the effort so that we can put back on those first century glasses and understand the meaning of the book of Revelation. Let's look in Schofield's Reference Bible. Again, I've got it here in front of me. And we've got down on page 355 what he has to say under Revelation 19.7. He says, The Lamb's wife is the bride. Revelation 21.9. The church. Identified with the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. Then he says this, And to be distinguished from Israel, the adulterous and repudiated wife of Jehovah yet to be restored, Isaiah 54, 1 to 10, Hosea 2, 1 to 17, who is identified with the earth, Hosea 2, at verse 23. A forgiven and restored wife could not be called either a virgin, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, or a bride. What did, what did Schofield do here? He said that the church is to be distinguished from Israel. And upon what basis does he state that? He says, well, the church is the heavenly Jerusalem. That's right. Then he mentions the lamb's wife, Revelation 21, 9. Well, wait a second, wait a second. I thought this was the same guy that told us back in the early part of his footnote that the church is not mentioned again after chapter 3, verse 22. You remember that study of that? I don't know why that's not embarrassing to a premillennialist. I guess they make so many false predictions they just get desensitized to it and get callous to the Word of God and their conscience is seared as with a hot iron and they can't see the impact of such a contradiction as that. I'm glad he notices the church is here. But friends, he said earlier in chapter 3 verse 22, that's the last you hear about the church. No, it's not either. The church of Christ is never going to be destroyed. It will stand forever. It is that indestructible everlasting kingdom of Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 prophesied by Daniel in chapter 2 at verse 44. But he recognizes that there is the concept of the church. But he says it is to be distinguished from Israel. And he states Israel's sins. And to do that, he goes back to Hosea chapter 2 at verse 23 where reference is made to Israel as an adulterous wife in the earth. And then he wants to say that Israel has favored nation status. Now what I have always thought as we've studied premillennialists and heard these people praise Israel and say they're God's chosen people and that they're always going to be blessed and they can never do anything to lose favor with God is that Israel is elevated over and above the church. That's the way they've always presented it till we get down here in Schofield's footnotes to the end of the Bible. And what he wants to imply here is that the church will be taken up to heaven and Israel's going to have the earth. He puts the church over Israel in this passage of Scripture when he gets out here. I'll tell you, you need a scorecard to keep up with the premillennialists. They change their mind so much and say whatever pops in their head so often. Well, what about that? Is the church to be distinguished from Israel? Absolutely not. It is the case that the church is the Israel of God. I've shown that before in previous studies together. If you remember that, great. We were talking about Galatians 1-2, a book that was written to whom? To the churches of Galatia. But how are they referenced in Galatians 6 at verse 16? They are referenced as the Israel of God. To as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them and mercy. And upon the Israel of God, the churches are the Israel of God. The church is not to be distinguished from Israel. Remember at that time when we studied that, we dropped back and read Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision that which is in the heart, not in the letter. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Remember that? Today Paul is writing to Christians at Rome, telling them they are spiritual Jews. And there are, God does, no, does not recognize, there are no longer physical Jews that are recognized in, a, in an acceptable position to God Most High. The church is the Israel of God. Christians are spiritual Jews. The church is not to be distinguished from Israel. The church is the Israel of God. Now watch this. Schofield just quoted, or just listed rather, Hosea chapter 2 at verse 22. Would you like to see where that passage is used in the New Testament? Let's just use this as a kind of a test of the things that I'm telling you just now. I would advise that. We are told to prove all things. 
Hold fast that which is good. Does Hosea 2 at verse 23, 22 and 23, does that support the view that the church is not to be distinguished from Israel, that the church is the Israel of God? Well, now, if we see that in Hosea 2, 22 and 23, and we could go over to the New Testament, and we could find that passage quoted somewhere in the New Testament and determine the contextual way in which it is used, we could find the answer to that question. We can do that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and you will be a, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Look at that. The very verses that Hosea presents in Hosea 2 are now found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, a book that is written to whom? It is written to the church at Corinth. The application made with Hosea's prophecy by the Apostle Paul proves the point that the church is not to be distinguished from Israel. The church is the Israel of God. Schofield is wrong on that. And something else I want to point out since we're so close to it right here is you remember Schofield makes this statement. He even gives us the passage right here, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. He says, A forgiven, restored wife could not be called either a virgin or a bride. Now, I want you to see the unvarnished arrogance of the premillennialist. Note, let me read it again. A forgiven and restored wife could not be called either a virgin or a bride. And he cites, he's got it right here. You see that? He's got it right here, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3. But watch what Paul does in 2 Corinthians 2 and 3. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, who? The church at Corinth. I have espoused you that I may present you, who? The church of God at Corinth, as a chaste bride. That's why I say this is the unvarnished arrogance of the premillennialist to state, as is found right here in this footnote, that, as, as Schofield does, a forgiven and restored wife could not be called either a virgin or a bride, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. And the verse says, Paul, that it says, Paul says that is exactly what he is doing, presenting you as a chaste virgin to Christ. When these people were forgiven of their sins, they became sons and daughters of God, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. They were in an acceptable relationship with God. He had removed them from their sins as far as the east is from the, from the west. He had dropped their sins in the depths of the sea. And yet, these premillennialists take a look at a verse of Scripture, look right straight at it and deny it. I tell you, it is very upsetting and alarming to see that taking place as someone mishandles the Word of God in any such fashion as that. Let's look further. Look with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, the subject here undertaken by the Apostle Paul is that of the church of Christ. And in his discussion of the church, he says in verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. For as the husband is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church, even so Christ is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The church is the bride of Christ. Now watch this. Remember in Ephesians 2.16, the apostle said, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. Both what? Or rather we should say both whom? Both Jew and Gentile are reconciled in one body by the cross of Christ. Watch chapter 3 at verse 15 of Paul's book. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15. My pages are stuck together. Give me just a second. Here it is. I've got it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15. Paul wrote, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family 
in heaven and earth is named after Christ. What is he talking about? He's talking about the church of Christ. Reconciled in one body. The body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Reconciled or made friends again with God in that body, in that church. Well, is he talking about Israel or is he talking about the church leaving Israel out? I'll tell you, he's got it all encompassing in chapter 3, verse 15 of Ephesians. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Friends, that leaves no one out. Everyone that is acceptable in the sight of God is included in that one same family, the family of God. It is called the household of Christ. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The house of God is a way of referring to the family of God. And what is it? It is the pillar and the ground of the truth. It is the whole family in heaven and earth. If anyone is acceptable before God in heaven and in earth, guess where they are? They're in the body of Christ, the church of Christ. Well, notice again with me in the book of Ephesians, this time chapter 4. We are admonished to retain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace in verse 3. And then the Bible says in verse 4, there is one body. That's O-N-E. One body. And that body, friends, is the church. Schofield does a disservice to his readers when he makes the statement that the church is to be distinguished from Israel, that it is different from Israel somehow. And it is unfortunate that he takes that course of action because in so doing, he brings disrepute upon himself and his writings along with those who blindly follow his lead. Well, we've had the chance today to be taking a look at the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I would like to conclude our sessions today by reviewing what we have seen thus far in the book of Revelation. We're in that period of the grand finale of the book. Let's review and let's review our challenge to it in premillennialism before we conclude our study today and then move to the final chapters of this book, 20 through 22. We will notice that in the opening chapter of the book, John gives an outline of the book in verse 19. He is told in writing about the things which must shortly come to pass that he is to write about the things that he has seen. And we have also noted that that is chapters 1 to 5. The things which are, chapter 6 through chapter 18. And the things which shall be hereafter. That is chapters 19 through 22. That is an outline that John gave us in the opening chapter of the book. We have followed that all the way through. And we've come down now to the things which shall be hereafter. Where the Lord has mentioned to us the victory of Jesus Christ over his enemies. We're going to see the devil's doom. We're going to also see heaven, a picture of heaven described. And we're going to see a further and final description of heaven in chapter 22. We have then taken an outline from the book that we created based upon material in the book where we connect a series of sevens together that John himself connects together, sequentially unveiling the message of the book of Revelation. We have read about the seven churches and the letters to them. We have read about a book with seven seals and the one who was given the authority who alone was found worthy to open that book with seven seals. We have noted just like with each church being addressed in sequential fashion, one through seven, even so those seals are undone or unlatched one through seven as the message is revealed. When the seventh seal is open, we learn that there were seven angels given seven trumpets. We're anticipating an announcement coming from them. And as those trumpets were turned, were, were blown, each one in order, we find with the seventh trumpet, there came the key message of the book about the kingdoms of the world becoming the kingdoms of Christ. He's going to reign forever and forever in chapter 11, verse 15. Then we also saw that there was seen seven angels in heaven given seven vials or seven bowls of wrath. They in turn began to pour these bowls of wrath out on the earth in chapter 16. Then in chapter 17, we saw here the Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She's variously described there. We have given the definition of that to mean Rome, the city of Rome itself, the harlot, the beast, the Roman Empire itself. And we've shown the proof of that. Then in chapter 18, we saw the fall of the Babylonian Empire, bringing us to the end of that section of the seven bowls of wrath. Then chapter 19, the grand finale has begun where we see Jesus Christ being victorious over all his foes. 
I think it is very important for us to see Christ in that way, that he is going to be victorious over every foe. And now then, the premillennial overview as we bring our study to a conclusion. We have seen that there are four paramount points to premillennialism. The first one is a so-called rapture. The second one is a seven-year period of tribulation. The third one is the battle of Armageddon. And the fourth one is the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. We have also in turn seen that none of these four points are sustained from the book of Revelation. We saw the trick that was tried to pull on us when someone wanted to take Daniel's 70th week from Daniel chapter 9, take it out of Daniel and drop it somewhere in the book of Revelation. We went exhaustively through the book looking for a week. We found days, we found months, we found years, we found a thousand years. We never one single time found that week. They just wish it was there. It's not there. The 70th week of Daniel stayed in Daniel chapter 9 and was concluded with the birth, the ministry, the death of Christ on Calvary's cross, and then finally and at last, we see the resurrection of Christ from the dead, his exaltation to God's right hand where he rules as king over his kingdom that the New Testament calls the church. That's what we have seen in that citation. Now then concerning the rapture, we have had the admonition of no less of an authority than Hal Lindsey that it is not a biblical word. On that basis, we should never even consider what he has to say about it to be truthful. Then we have seen this seven-year period of tribulation from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 18 that the premillennialists talk about, all of that being just only seven years and not something that the people in the first century would know anything about, but rather concluding out there at the end of time somewhere. And it takes a clairvoyant kind of person like a Schofield, a Lindsay, or a Valver to see it. But we have also noted a telling quotation from Valverde's commentary where he says that the proof of it is not in the book of Revelation. Some have looked for a panoramic view, but there is no explicit proof in the book. Well, with that admission, we should let that go also. Now then, today, we've studied about the Battle of Armageddon, and we have seen it variously embellished. But when we got there between verses 19 and 20, not a word about it. Nothing there. Why? Because soon as Christ appears, it's over before it begins. And we're going to continue our study and see the same truth regarding the so-called thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. We hope you'll come and be with us again as we pick up our study with Revelation chapter 20. See you.